God. Welcome to Energy Stew. This is Peter Roth, your host. And I'd like to ask you, are you willing to be a fool? Maybe you already are and are resisting it. But wouldn't it be nice to enjoy it? <laughs> well, maybe we can do that better. And to help us enjoy being ourselves in the best way we can, is the author of an incredible book called Becoming the Instrument. Now, maybe that relates to music, <laughs> I think so, but also maybe it also relates to us. And, and, and maybe we are an instrument, but we don't know how instrumental we are, maybe. And we're gonna find out so much more about this topic because the author of Becoming Instrument, Lessons on Self-Mastery from Music to Life, is Kenny Werner. Kenny, welcome to Energy Stew. I'm so glad that we could talk. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, glad to be here. You know, it's so fascinating to think of what becoming the instrument means. And, you know, and it's interpreted in some ways as a musician as you are and found that when you're in your music, it's in you, you're in it, it's kind of a oneness space, call it the space as you like to call it. Mm -hmm. and, and yet there's a difference when you're not. And, and to learn about that helps us differentiate and, and understand our process better, right? Yeah, you know, I think what people should understand is that well there's the second the subtitle of the book is actually probably the most important thing lessons in self-mastery from music to life there are lessons that musicians ones that really do play from the space that they have that are very transferable to all areas of life usually the musicians that are most uh in that space are the least verbal about it and then the people that are really eloquent about it, they often haven't actually experienced it. They <laughs> They're intellectual they, about it. <laughs> yeah, but they've studied it and they express it very well. Somebody can, nobody can get there from a book. All they can do is get an indication of what they might do to attain it. So the difference between one's philosophy, what one knows or believes, and the way they behave is a practice of some kind. So like in music, you really could have the most eloquent uh, lecture on how to play the piano. But if you never practiced the piano, you wouldn't be able to play anything at all. And it's the same thing with a philosophy. In order for a philosophy to implement, to become implementable in you, uh, it's all neurological at that point. You know, because where is it coming from? One of the things I try to point out in my book is that who cares? If you think it's coming from Jesus Christ, great. If you think it's coming from Charlie Parker, wonderful. You know, if it's coming from, you know, Bruno Mars, where, where, it really doesn't matter. The power is in our ability to have faith. So, for example, a musician routinely, uh, an improvising musician, like a jazz musician, uh, there's a lot to learn there from music to life. They routinely expect something to pour through them through the filter of a language that they studied, just because they speak the language doesn't mean they'll have something to say. But if they relax a certain part of the mind, they will receive nightly all the information and they let it pass through them. And really, uh, the other thing it says is that playing music is a bodily experience because without a body, you're not going to make a sound. So the information passes through them and then into the body to the degree that the body has been prepared. In other words, i.e. practicing, right? And they routinely expect something to manifest on a daily basis. So we, we can all get there, but we need an exercise. Without an exercise, I could be 15 and have a cosmic view of the universe. And then I could be 85 and I have the same cosmic view, but I've moved no closer to it. Right. Without, we have to accept it as right. some sort of practice that where you can practice being a fool. For example, but, but I want to ask you, and because this is a question I've had about 
precocious children who at four or five years old can play symphonies. And obviously they haven't practiced enough to know the depth of the talent that they're performing from. Well, I only have one answer that is, I don't know it to be the answer, but it's the only one that makes any sense and it's reincarnation. I mean, I can't right. make sense of it any other way. If you don't know, if you've never been to Italy and how do you know about the Parthenon or how do you know about, you know, Florence or, you know, I mean, if you haven't been there, so I've seen some of these young musicians, not just with the chops to play a symphony, but with the intuition that would have been picked up in years of traveling and gigging and touring. Sure. So I don't know this in reincarnation, but nothing else even attempts to explain it. Right. But to me, what's fascinating is because we can't explain it, I, there's another reason to surrender. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, we see when you surrender, you become the instrument. And that's why it's not, I use instrument, but if you remember in that particular chapter, I start off with the uh, prayers at St. Thomas. No, it's the St. Uh, I can't, you know, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. I love that. It's a much stronger prayer than say, Lord, help me be peaceful. You know, because it's still the, um, the manic, you know, the manager saying, help me steer myself towards peacefulness. But that prayer was smart enough to say, make me an instrument of your peace. That guarantees peace because peace is not coming from me. It's coming through me. And well, that I love that. Cultivated. And maybe that's how we have, well, that we do have to live our life this way. And, and that's why Lessons on Self Mastery from Music to Life teaches us how to be that instrument every day as much as we can. And I think yes. there's a lot of material in there that's very practical for how one would practice. You know, you, your first question to them, are you ready to be a fool today? Um, well, what do fools do? They rush in where wise men never go. I think that line is even in my, you know, from that song, that line is even in the book somewhere, which means that they, they're foolish because they don't consider failure to be a deterrent. Now, that kind of foolishness can be practiced and it can be practiced in a safer way than walking into the boardroom and deciding you're gonna be a fool. But there's a part of the brain uh, neurologically and which I can't explain scientifically, but the funny thing is I knew this all intuitively. You talk about being an intuitive teacher, you know, and, and lecturer and whatever uh, and clients. I knew intuitively and now the science is very supportive of that. The things that we wish we could do, but we don't do it's because of strong neural pathways that we're used to not doing. And the things that we uh, or wish we wouldn't do and we keep doing, like addiction, uh, that's because of also very strong neural pathways. And God may just be uh, the 11th percent of the brain. Who knows? But my point is, who cares? Because the giving humans, uh, humans never gave themselves the credit for the power they have. Even sometimes a a preacher or a, a evangelist will accidentally say the truth because they'll say it's the power of your faith. And that is truer than anybody imagines. So since anything you be, have faith in becomes real, you might make a choice. What, what would I like to have faith in that would give me the most experience of uh, moving forward with the least amount of effort? Well, I my bicycle moving with the wind at my back instead of the wind in my face. All right. What I, a lot of what I love in your book is your, your personal honesty and, and how, you know, you say that this, you didn't, you aren't trying to write an academic book and you're not trying to be smart so much as you're writing from the, the wisdom of your experience. And hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, and so you you tackled life that way, even from childhood when when you weren't supported in gaining education, right? And and you found that your love was when you found the space by touching your instrument, touching the piano, and all of a sudden you were 
in another place that you learn to trust more than your own mind. Well, that's interesting because what I actually teach people to do is how to accrue that special uh, space within themselves and elevate their art or elevate their skill through the channeling of the mind into just the subjects that it needs and not a lot of extraneous thought that uh, erodes our confidence and our energy before we even get started. So I'm teaching that and yet I was one of those children that uh, how is he playing like that? And I, I, it got there very fast. Uh, and my explanation is just because, you know, I can't think of any other explanation, but I don't know that that explanation is right. But yet, what I had another skill and I had another talent, which I never even cared about, which was I could comment when someone would, this is where it started, Peter. I would, somebody wanted me to teach them. So, because they saw me playing because of my own experiences. And they thought it doesn't even look like he's, even recently, Clint Eastwood saw me play in California, and he said, he said, God, you don't even look like you're touching the keys. What's, you know? and then he spoke <laughs> to some friends, and they called me, he said, he was talking about that again, you know. It is, so when people say to me, how do you do that? It often leads to a, a lesson. And then it was just another way to make some money, to give lessons. And when I started to give lessons, I started to notice people that weren't giving themselves the permission to be a fool. You know, right. to make mistakes and then get the good therapy from that. You know, because if you if you restrict your actions because you don't want to make a mistake, you may protect yourself in the short term, but you never really find the light that you possess. You have to overstep the bounds to uh, without fear to find out what the light is. So I started to comment on that and that whole thing evolved into lectures, master classes, and eventually uh, the first book, Effortless Mastery, was so complete because it was the end of a process, not the beginning. It wasn't after I studied something I wrote a book. After I lived, I wrote right. down what I knew worked and worked for people over and over again. Now it's been 25 years later, and for seven or eight years I've been teaching the steps in Effortless Mastery as semesters, which I never had to do before. And I'm the artistic director of the Effortless Mastery Institute at Berkeley, and in fact, we have a minor in effortless mastery that also goes along with yoga classes and Qigong and, you know, in other words, we all understand that there's a conscious mind, there's a self-conscious mind, obviously, and there's a super conscious mind. And the super conscious mind is what connects what they also call the universal mind. And getting there is not that hard to do. Staying there is tricky, but to what I, what I, to non-committed yogis like myself to lazy yogis like myself i found out it was much more powerful to get there fully even for 20 seconds than it would be to be sort of have it some negotiated mix for five minutes and then the mind takes a picture of this says wow there's you with all your light and no doubts and no fears and what you observe from that even a minute long is energy you didn't know you had new ideas or faith in the ideas you have or no fear of the ideas you have because they might be wrong. It just puts you in another place. It puts you in the seat of power because it takes away the threat of failure. And what I love in the, in the back of the book or the back part of the book is how your teachings about practice and how to develop skills in ways that um, aren't aren't taught normally. Uh, you talk about um, MSD, <laughs> music school disease. <laughs> yeah. And also uh, PT, what is it? Uh, PTSD, right. Uh, P, uh, what is the D in PTSD? Um, uh, PT, uh, dysfunction. Is it this function? I, it might be. I, off the top of my head, I, I'm not. Okay, so anyway, this is uh, a PTCD. Uh, uh, what are the first letters? Boy, I guess it's early. I just got back. I, I don't know. I, I, I just know what it means. And... Well, I just switched to uh, one letter and put in the C for critique. If you go to school, you've been critiqued to death. And when that critiquer enters your head and when you're alone, you're still being critiqued. 
it's essentially ruined your voice, your art form. Interesting. Um, yeah, because what is it that we know that we are excelling and, and the idea in this is not to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, the, the greater freedom is that, that see, from the, from the conscious mind, you always want to believe you're excelling because you want to believe your life has had some meaning. So if you chose to do something, you want to believe that it's succeeding on some level. From the space, that question never occurs to you. Right. And, and so the idea is, be, be, is being willing and not only to be a fool, but you know, to understand the value, the importance of the space. Yeah, and then let go of that. Right. I find, like my students, I have to remind them every week, don't make this important. It could be life-changing. But if you start making it important, then you're going to have trouble doing it. Yeah, have, because then I'm you're... The right, I'm not in right. the right space to do this now. Why? If I told you to look out the window for 30 seconds a day, would you have trouble doing that no matter what happened in your life? And I gave you the assignment looking out the window for 30 uh, seconds a day? No, of course not. So if you think of watching yourself breathe with the same lack of meaning, you can do it anytime. What they will find is that they let go in that moment of the past, of the future, and all the baggage involved with that, and they get the energy of this moment. I love that. And the creativity of this moment. And to not bruise the creativity, you have to be willing to let the creativity create. And that means that you're not in charge of when you're going to succeed or fail, but you're riding the crest of creativity. That Some people say, I don't know how to be creative. No, you just don't want to risk being creative. But if you play a note and then you play another note, you are improvising. Right. And you talk about jazz uh, as kind of an, um, an excellent medium for improvisation and for you know breaking the mold. Well, it is improvisation because for all the, you might hear a jazz piece is 10 minutes long, but if you saw the music they read, it was one page. So, so the rest of that time was improvisation and it's a skill. It's improvisation on the form of that. But this is what life is. Improvisation, the form is life. We're born, we have to go to school, we have to make some money, we choose to get married or not, we have kids or not. This is a form. How much freedom and improvisation can we enjoy within that form? So what I like about jazz it, uh, specifically is that when someone makes a mistake and then they are absolutely 100% behind it because they did it, it often leads to a new music. Right. There's no other music I can think of like that. Or maybe it was like that 300 or 400 years ago when all the great composers were improvisers. And you also talk about bringing other notes in, other, you know, other kinds of music from the East and, and how that helps us see and, and, and feel differently. Well, I brought the aesthetic in from the East or the West, not, not necessarily the music, although anyone can profit from the listening or playing of any of the music from you know India or Pakistan or but but it's not the music it's the it's the uh, basic attitude in other words I think I gave this comparison of Eastern and Western religion from a distinctly non erudite you know uh, non academic way meaning the the West always thinks that they're inventing the re wheel and reinventing the wheel like John Cage came up with this great piece two minutes and 32 seconds of silence. Wow, John Cage invented silence. Whereas in the East, they know the wheel was there before them and the wheel will be there after them. And what they spend their life is attuning into what is. And as they attune into what is, and they make their body the instrument, meaning learning the, the times and the changes and the ragas and all that, then they will become an instrument of, a, of a, something that's already completely finished our job is to tune into it, not to think that we invented it. But there's great, it's a great plan that we have the East and the West. All the excitement comes from the West and, and all the wisdom comes from the East. And it's not, it's not a, a geographic thing either because we had that with the Indians in the West. We had that in South America. Sure. We've had it, any indigenous people intuitively knew that when they saw a tree that they could bow to it just as soon as walk by it you know and so the question is 
are they miss are they being uh, primitive and bowing to a tree and or are do they have or have they re, do they have the point that everything is worth bowing to well i think you're really a great eastern teacher <laughs> well i like to think of it though because i am from the uh south shore of long island so you know, <laughs> and it is sort of east so i'll take that as a cop that's the point when we externalize it to be a thing you know like a philosophy with a name or a, a certain country or then we almost assure ourselves that it'll never be us we have to find all the things that we already think about ourselves as nonsensical or useless or or non-spiritual and spiritualize it and fully fill in our life with that and then it becomes an art what i like about my own books is that i'm sure i write no other language but my own because including humor uh because if they didn't have humor in it it wouldn't be my it wouldn't be my book no i i loved reading the book and it had so much so many important uh segments to the book there's all oh there are a lot of tips on patience <laughs> right well see th there you go like when you try to be patient you're really kind of you know fighting with the needle patience oh it's a little over here a little impatience but if you find the space that's the absence of impatience so patience becomes the f the background from which your silence is where from silence is where a note might come from. People that haven't been silent in like 50 years, they have no idea where the notes come from because one note just tumbles into another. But if you can always retreat back into the silence, then the, the light of the next note is so powerful. And that's why some musicians can play a note and tip the world on, its an, on an angle. And another people, other people can play a thousand notes and you can just sit there and go, man, did I leave my keys in the door? or? Well, you, you talk about Miles Davis in the book. Yeah, Miles Davis honored his limitations. And by honoring his limitations, he created the music of the 50s, the birth of the cool. <laughs> it had to be cool because he didn't have Dizzy Gillespie's tempos like that. And he couldn't do all the acrobatics with Dizzy Gillespie. So does he consider himself deficient of Dizzy Gillespie or uh, a divine entity that takes into account everything that he can do? and honors everything he can't do. Right, to be purely and doing himself. that, you become a much more potent force in the society that you dwell in. Right, he found his space. Yeah, uh, and that's a lesson from music to, you know, from music to life. The more one honors what their voice is, regardless of what it is. If someone's looking for a voice, they'll never find it. It's, it's like a dog chasing his tail. It's like saying, this is who I am, but I'm looking for who I should be. You can spend a lifetime doing that. The best way to find a sound that you love is to practice, again, a practice, loving the first sound you make. And what happens is the sound does morph because it takes in that relation. Instead of expectation, which weakens the sound, you have blanket accept it you're practicing loving it which means very often as as you know in transformational work acting as if you love it when you really don't and then all of a sudden you pick up the sweetness of it and coincidentally the sound has become sweeter and you find your voice by honoring the voice you have and this is what we learn from music and anyone who can replicate that or use that lesson in anything that they want to do in life I love that because I've been told many times I do not have a singing voice. And when I start singing, everybody just leaves. <laughs> and so I, I, what I realized, and people have told me many times, is they, they like my voice when I'm speaking. And that's why I do radio shows. And I, I love this. I love talking. So I, I'm enjoying my voice. And I just use it in ways that I feel best. Yeah, but I would I don't think anybody's barred by the acceptance or rejection uh, of, of others. When something comes from within, it has the ring of authenticity. And I'll give you an example in music. Uh, when I first made a record with my tr a trio record, I had all in my head, what is a good jazz record? You know, so I don't know if I obeyed every intuition. 
I had. I obeyed everything I thought belonged to a jazz record. And it was a good record, but whenever I got a bad review, it really hurt. It really hurt because I was trying to make a record that people would like. <laughs> but, I, but I learned that lesson, the first record. And the next record, I said, I know what turns me on. Even though I'm a jazz player, I love Sgt. Pepper's. I love Days of Future Past. I love music that's a journey, but my language may be jazz. So this one, I'm going to start it the way I want to start it, and I'm going to let it move the way it would move me. And that one also had a much better reception, but that wasn't the point. If it didn't have a good reception, I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have hurt. Right. No, I love that because you... Because I was led. You were in your truth. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a... When, when someone wants... When someone, you know, it's some kind of a paradox. When someone wants to be liked, uh, it's really hard for them to, to get that. And when someone moves from within, they draw people to them like, like bees to honey. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. And we're getting near the end of the show. And uh, the book is called Becoming the Instrument, Lessons on Self-Mastery from Music to Life. And you are Kenny Werner. And uh, how do people follow up on this where do they go uh, oh, i think they would get well of course it sells amazon bnn it sells everywhere right and if they want to get it from me uh if they just go to kennywerner.com oh, and uh, because not only that if they like the ideas in the book you'll always see what it is i'm doing to support people in that sometimes i'm doing uh zooms like this and i'm playing piano and i'm freaking out and i'm being funny and 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 getting a lot of smiles and these days we need a lot of smiles. So uh, if I'm doing anything free or I'm doing an online course and you think this would lead, the book tells me that this is where I want to go. Uh, you'd find that all out at KennyWerner.com. Oh, I love that. This, is, this has been terrific because it's so important for people to become the instrument. <laughs> well, I think, you know, we have, obviously, we always have diverging forces. I don't know why it's that way. Maybe that's what makes for good drama. But as we see a lot of darkness, I see more light around me in people that never associated with light, like corporations that want, you know, bring in light or they want to, they're already successful on a physical level and something's still missing. So I see a lot of understanding now of what it is we need to do. But uh, in the individual working on it will bring us along collectively, I believe. Yeah, and your book is so helpful. Thank you. I, I'm really happy to be talking with you and, and uh, that you can be on Energy Stew. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Maybe we'll see you in New York when uh, I'm playing there. So I would love that. I'm yeah. probably playing there in the summer. So Good. Um, and, th and this is Peter Roth, your host of Energy Stew at prn.live. I can be reached at peter at heartriver, H-E-A-R-T river.org. I'd love to hear from you and thanks so much for listening.